PPN Twitter. If you can retweet us, that would be very much appreciated. Is that? I think that's everything, Liz. I've yeah, tried to be short and sweet. I just wanted to add, obviously, we're looking at this as being a Northwest event um, initially. I know, obviously, there's Northeast people here as well. And I know that you're having your own conversations around community practice for PWPs and hopefully other psychological practitioners as well. So we're more than happy to share information and have further conversations afterwards as to how that goes. But initially, this is a, a Northwest event for um the Northwest Psychological Practitioners as part of the Northwest PPN at this stage. But yeah, thank you all very much for listening to us. Um, I, we've, I think we've clawed back a little bit of time for you, Andrew, so we're still on time for your slot. Um, and obviously, if there's any other questions, then please let us know. But um, yeah, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you both very much, Elspeth and Liz. Uh, that was a great overview of, of what's really nice to see as a sort of relaunch of something that's been a, a, a really important part of, of, of meeting the needs of, of this um, uh, professional group and, and that you're expanding it to take into account those new low intensity roles that have been uh, developed and have been been developed for the past few years now and kind of bringing them in to the fold, which is which is really uh, lovely to see. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have got time for questions. If anybody in the audience would like to pick anything up, uh, either put it in the chat or feel free to raise a hand or unmute yourself. See, we were so succinct and informative that no one had anything to ask. Wow. It, it was very much a, a bit of a, an advertisement and a plug, though, and, and hopefully feels like a really positive relaunch of something that has been such a useful network for us over the last eight or nine years. We really don't want to lose that. But as you say, Andrew, it feels like a good opportunity to build on it and open it up. It really does. So, so um, yeah, thank you both very, very much. And um, very much looking forward to the 14th of December as well, an opportunity to um, uh, to get together with um, some colleagues from the low intensity workforce world and, and think about some of those therapeutic and service challenges that, 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 that we face. So, yeah, very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, Andrew. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about some work that actually Liz has been very much involved with and, and would have probably been uh, a better candidate to do this presentation uh, than me um, as, as someone who's who's really um, kind of been a very active part and very involved part of um, uh, the, developing the low intensity workforce and working towards uh, accreditation, uh, which has been a, a huge piece of work across a couple of organisations, um, BPS and uh, BABCP. I'm going to give an update on on how that's going. I'm just going to share slides now. Um, that should be should be appearing any second. Um, and I'll take probably 10 or 15 minutes and then have time for some questions. Um, and then we'll uh, Christina and I will get together to, to summarise the morning. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge not, not just Liz's work on this, but the work of uh, Helen MacDonald and Claire Tilly. So Helen representing the BABCP and Claire Tilly representing the BPS um, in, in, in moving forward to ensure that we've got some really good and effective systems of, of uh, uh, low intensity worker uh, registration. Um, and this has been a, a kind of three year project, really. Um, Adrian Whittington, David Clark were both very much involved in initiating this and it's been great over the past few years to see it um, really come together uh, uh, and, and there's all sorts of reasons why that, that's going to be to the benefit of our low intensity workforce. I'm going to give a quick overview of what those might be. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the registration scheme to talk a little bit about context and background and think about the next steps and there may be time for um, questions at the end. Um, so the NHS long term plan set some really ambitious targets in terms of developing uh, our workforce, both uh, in terms of meeting the needs of working age adults and older adults and uh, children and young people. And a, and a big part of that uh, work around children and young people was developing two distinct uh, low intensity roles within the uh, uh, CYP workforce. Um, so we've got the PWPs, a very well established um, professional group. Um, within within the, the mental health field, but but the children's wellbeing practitioners 
um, which is a low intensity intervention, uh, predominantly based in CAMS and third sector organisations and educational mental health practitioners. So EMHPs who are based, as the name suggests, in schools. Um, and and the, the ambitions for these workforces were considerable. Yeah, 8,000 new low intensity practitioners over the, the, the course of the plan. Um, uh, meant that there needed to be some real clarity of thinking about how to support and develop this workforce going forwards. And registration has been, I think, an important part of that. Um, and, and also the wider context of these, these new workforces were specific to England, but there are low intensity uh, practitioner posts and, and, and uh, projects in all the home nations as well. Um, but, but they're slightly different uh, to reflect different uh, local needs. Um, so why is registration important? I mean, registration is something that um, has been a, a key part of, of many therapists' lives for many years. And, and you know, cognitive behaviour therapists, for example, have been uh, registered and accredited with BABCP. Um, that's provided some really useful structures in terms of thinking about people's development and CPD. Um, and it was understood that, that we needed to do something similar for the low intensity uh, workforce. It, it, it helps to protect the public so that, so that people know that when they're seeing someone who is one of the low intensity practitioners, uh, that there are certain training standards and professional standards that have been adhered to. Um, registration also makes sure that there's a kind of framework for uh, for, for collaboration between uh, national bodies, employers and other key stakeholders. So it kind of brings people together in a conversation about this workforce and, and meeting its needs and ensuring fidelity to the model and that, uh, and that CPD is well supported. Um, it, it enables a kind of clarity around entry into the professions, um, which I think is really helpful. Um, I think it's a, it has a sort of role in terms of advocacy as well. Um, when you work towards registration, it, it makes sure that, that this workforce is very clearly understood uh, and, and part of ongoing discussions uh, at a kind of national level. Um, and I personally found it a really helpful process um, to observe and to be a very small part of to see how the BPS and the BABCP could work together strategically. Uh, and think as two organisations who were uh, very much interested in this workforce and supporting this workforce, how how they could work collaboratively to ensure that the workforce needs were, were best met. So lots of good reasons why registration would be introduced. Um, I mean, registration is, is, is is useful for the public, it's useful strategically, but it's also useful for the PWPs themselves. Now we appreciate that uh, at the time of, of um, uh, developing this, that, that of course this was an additional cost and burden uh, to PWPs, so, so it wasn't a kind of neutral exercise from that point of view, but what it did do in terms of benefits was introduce this very, very clear uh, recognition of the importance of the role, to put some clear boundaries about the role, about who could call themselves a PWP or a EMHP or CWP um, and, and enabled uh, a kind of clarification about the professional status of this uh, staff group that, that improved its recognition, I think. And that was really important because it's such a large part of the mental health workforce that, that it, it was seen as strategically really important to recognise that. Uh, and to give that kind of professional identity that, that registration brings. So I, I really appreciate that it, it may seem burdensome at first, both to make the application uh, and to, to maintain accreditation, but the benefits in terms of that recognition of the importance of role, I, I, I hope it will, will be really apparent that, that it's more than worth it. And, and as it currently stands, there's, there's over two and a half thousand PWPs have become uh, registered and whose accreditation is recognised now between those two organisations, the BPS and BABCP. Um, and I, I should say it's been at first when um, we were at the meetings where it was decided that um, that both organisations would be accrediting bodies. Um, I, that, that seemed to me um, that it was going to be quite a challenge, but I actually think it's been a real benefit because uh, it's meant that both organisations, uh, both organisations wanted 
uh, uh, PWPs to, to choose to be registered with them. And I think what it's meant is that, that both BPS and BABCP have worked hard to make themselves look like a good accrediting organisation in terms of what they offer and, 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 and how they support uh, those workforces. And I, I think that's been real positive that we both work together collaboratively, but have also both kind of uh, upped our gains a little bit in terms of in terms of what we offer as part of our registration. Uh, and I think that's been really positive in terms of in terms of uh, then what we can do for the workforce. Um, so just a quick summary of the registration scheme. So this was an NHS England specification that both organisations work to. Um, a distinct, distinct requirements for each occupation who are who are included on the register. Um, both organisations, BABCP and BPS, needed to be accredited with the, the, the PSA. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, that was a big piece of work for both organisations to, to reach the kind of standards that the P PSA asks. But ultimately, that's that's to the benefit of registrants because it improves organisational processes, improves what the organisation can do. Um, there's there's both organisations signed up for having uh, to, to, to having close adherence to the national competency frameworks and 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 to recognise accredited training. And the BPS are the accrediting body for the low intensity uh, training course. Um, uh, really important is we recognise that this is a, a, a generally a low paid workforce. So the registration um, and, and the membership that, that comes with that needed to be low cost. I think that was really good that NHS England and Adrian Whittington in particular kind of particular drove that through, made sure this was an affordable scheme um, and, and made sure that those two organisations had, had a good level of alignment between them. Um, yeah, so PSA, Professional Standards Authority, was, I must admit, an organisation that I'd not heard of before this uh, process started. Um, but uh, but it's um, it's a statutory body and it ensures that organisations that, 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 that register professionals, um, uh, that organisations that register professionals adhere to very clear standards in terms of things like how they manage uh, complaints, that this is this is done well and in a, a timely uh, manner, that there are rigorous standards, um, that, that information around what's done and how it's done is clear. And, and I think although it seemed like a, a big and burdensome tasks for the uh, or both organisations, uh, in fact, the, the time invested in this improved the organisations across the board really in terms of their um, their structures and governance um, but it was a big investment in time um, but I think one that that that, that was worthwhile um, so the scheme was live from June 2021 um, but but uh, that registration became a, a requirement in June 2022 so people had a, a kind of years to, to, to get membership of their chosen organisation and to start the accreditation process. It's probably fair to say that, that many people waited until quite close to the deadline before they started their accreditation process. And probably more people made that decision quite late on than both organisations were expecting. So it did mean that if you applied for accreditation early on from, from June 2021, the accreditation process was quite quick. And it got a little bit slower towards the deadline as, as there was this huge bulk of uh, bulge of applicants. But but both organisations have worked hard and taken on extra staff and staff have worked weekends and evenings to move through those um, uh, the, those additional applicants uh, as quickly and in as timely a way as possible. Um, so um, what else is the, to say about this? So the register for PDWPs has, has launched. Um, there is a, an awareness that that, that, that that there needs to be a four nations view to think about home nations as well. But the initial work has focused on uh, England uh, uh, because that's where the bulk of the workforce is and the driver came from uh, NHS England. But we've tried to to hold in mind that that, that wider workforce. Um, uh, so the the CWP and EMHP training programs are, are been accredited by the BPS. Um, that, that process started at the beginning of this year. Um, nothing much else to say about that. I'm very aware of, of, of uh, times passing. Um, so, so to join the PWP register, 
Um, you need to be a member of whichever organisation you need to register with, so people have a choice. Um, you need to have completed a BPS accredited IAPT low intensity course uh, or an HE commissioned uh, PWP assessment of competence scheme. I've been practising for at least six months, have a supervisor's report um, and make declarations around working within a spe specified system of care. So you can't get this registration if you're working outside of, of, of the NHS framework, but, but that does include the third sector organisations that, um, that that provide kind of IAPT and, and, and CYP IAPT services. Um, I think what I'm going to do is actually finish in a moment rather than go into the detail of this. Um, just to say that there are kind of ongoing CPD requirements. I think this is a really good thing because it ensures that people can go to their employee, uh, their employer and say, in order to retain uh, my accreditation, and that's important uh, for us as an organisation, I need to access a certain amount of CPD each year. And then that gives um, the leverage to get both the uh, time off for study days and um, uh, for that to be um, uh, funded as well. So I think that's really useful that there are CPD requirements um, and that those are monitored as part of the uh, ongoing registration and re-registration process. Um, and people need to access good quality and appropriate supervision uh, from an accredited supervisor. Uh, as with the CBT supervision, um, uh, supervision needs to include a live component and that's sort of reviewing some recordings, um, which I think again is really useful in terms of maintaining good practice. Uh, people will be expected to, to, to complete an annual declaration that they've met those, those uh, basic standards. Um, so I, I just want to finish by saying it's been an absolute pleasure to be part of this process. Uh, it's, it's been great to, to work across organisations and with NHS England and to get uh, input from people like uh, uh, Liz, who's been a, a key part of our thinking on making sure this is done well. Um, and, and to welcome those of you um, who are PWPs to the uh, to, to, to the register. Uh, so right on time, I'm finished. We've just got 10 minutes left for additional questions and comments. Um, I'm just going to take a quick look at the chat, although I'll stop sharing um, before I do that. Um, excuse me one second. I don't seem to be able to stop sharing right this minute. Uh, got there. OK. Um, so let's see if there's any additional questions or we'll, uh, and, and if there are, we'll pick those up. And if not, we'll move to the to the summary of the day. Um, there, there was a question, um, Andrew, from Kate Thomason. Um, something about can the BA BCP case management and supervision requirements for senior PWPs be adjusted to those of PWPs due to the difference in role, i.e. lower caseload? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't quite understand the, the technical aspects of that question, if I'm honest. I don't know if um, K might want to pick up. If you could unmute and it, it kind of explain that to me, then that, it's certainly something, if I understand it properly, I can pick that up with our uh, accreditation uh, team and see uh, what they think about that. Um, yeah, hi, Andrew. Uh, it was just a okay. query from our, our senior PWPs um, who have just looked at the requirements. So they've, uh, I believe it's an hour of case management supervision that they would need, which is what the PWPs require. But obviously, the role of a senior is quite different. Um, so I think we would just struggle a bit to accommodate that in the service having to have an hour a week of case management and an hour a fortnight of clinical skills because we have four four seniors in our service so it's quite a lot of of time out from their role okay what what i'll do is um honestly can't answer that in a sensible way uh liz kel might have a view on it but but uh i was just going to say and i could be wrong about this i think that there is a a formula that's probably not the right word for if a qualified pwp was part time for those requirements to be pro rata So I was under the impression that the same would apply that because you had a smaller caseload, it would also be pro rata But 
I'm not 100% sure, so it probably is right that we take it back to the team, Andrew, but that would be my understanding of it, that it would be reflective of your caseload size, not your working hours size, if that makes sense, Kate. Yeah, no, that was my kind of assumption, but I think they did query it with the BABCP and then were told that it's the same. But if, yeah, if you could take that back, that would be great. Thank you. Your pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Liz. There's, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, it's OK. There's always there's always going to be questions that we haven't thought through the answers of that come up as this comes out. You know, it is still a learning process, but we are slowly working through them as they come through. I think when you have a new house built, they call it snags, don't they? And they're just the small things that in the building of it, you know, there will be little things that just need tweaking and adjusting. And and, and it's such a big project um, that, that, yeah, I think you're right, Liz, but we're going to find those as we go along. Um, any other questions or, or, or comments before we, we begin to wrap up the morning? In which case, Christina, um, I just want to make a, a, a quick reflection. Um, which is which is I've really enjoyed um, a day where we've zoomed in and out of, of the work that we do and um, hearing about the importance of um, uh, experts by experience in shaping our service, hearing about how uh, data can help us understand what we do um, and get that kind of overview of what's going on at a service level, but then applying that at an individual level to to to, to how to do the best by the people that we're working with. And then taking a minute to reflect on the self in that process. And I've I've really enjoyed that kind of um, zooming in and out process of, of this morning. And I don't know how you've um, uh, found that, Christina. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like we've kind of got, got almost like a, a full body experience, if you like. We've kind of got, you know, something something from the national team. You know, there's some, you know, the updates with registration schemes, the PWP expansion, the community of practice. Um, and then, you know, really down to, to the nitty gritty then of, you know, who is it that comes through our door for help and how can we best help them, you know, and, and reflective practice as, as part of, you know, that process of, of how we can best help that, that population who come to us for help. So it's been, and I, I've really enjoyed the variety today. It's felt like we've had some some policy, some, some national um, updates, but we've also had some, you know, some real clinical meaty clinical stuff to think about as well so I've I've really really enjoyed the variety of that I'm, I'm just aware that there was a hand up just there I don't know if it was a hand that went up and a hand that went down um but we don't I want attempted to... to answer the question in the chat Christina because it had been posted in the chat so yeah I so yeah. so sorry it wasn't my hand but I think I answered the question in the chat so that's why the hand went back down Thank Thank you, yes that's fine yeah yeah okay so yeah I, I guess on on that note um we've got about five minutes left of today um are there any further questions comments or thoughts or dale did you want to pick up on um one one or two of the questions that that yeah, there were, there were a couple of questions earlier on, yeah. Christina. Yeah. One was about whether we'd taken into account kind of any indices of multiple deprivation or social deprivation into that uh, analysis. Uh, we, we didn't in that particular analysis. We have done previously and uh, it followed the pattern you might expect really in terms of lower recovery rates and to some extent lower reli reliable improvement rates depend upon the, the rank order in terms of indices of multiple deprivation. Uh, in terms of modalities, I think the other question, um, we didn't look at the, you didn't sub-analyze in terms of look at the step three modality people had received uh, in, that, in that data set. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, thanks for, for answering those questions and thank you for the patience of the people who asked the questions, but we did we did get to answer them in the end. So any other thoughts, comments, queries or Andrew, does it simply fall to you and I to say a massive thank you to the PPN team for organising 
today um, and and a special thank you to everybody who has um, presented a talk or contributed um, in any way, you know, towards, you know, towards making today the what I think has been a success, making to make, helping to make today the success that it's been. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. OK, so are we are we going to do the are we going to do a, a three minute early finish, which probably gives everybody time to put the kettle on before they 